And so it kind of dawned on me, I had to make a switch of like, I'm not an influencer, I'm a writer, you know? I, I would like to be an artist. I want to make things that I will be proud of long-term. Like look at Rumi and Hafiz, like those poems have lasted since 1250. Creating something that is that honest, where it lasts through so many generations, you know, I'm not saying I'll do that, but I'm just saying like that is something that I would far rather aspire to versus like having 15 million on TikTok. Welcome everyone to another mind and heart opening conversation on Just Tap In. I'm your host Emilio and today I'm introducing someone who is truly leading from a place of honesty and empathy. Ali Michelle is a two-time best-selling poet known for her transformative works, explorations of a cosmic soul, and a rose that blooms in the night. She is a healer who hosts yoga, breathwork, meditation, and artistry retreats all around the world. Through the written word, she is inspiring others to find the strength that it takes to be soft and strong and leads people back into her heart. Most recently, Ali has teamed up with the American model Alexis Wren as co-founder of We Are Warriors in order to bring female leadership to the NFT and crypto space. After building a huge social media following and traveling the world and eventually coming across creator burnout, realizing that that lifestyle was not truly fulfilling her, she is now focused on creating work that will leave a long lasting impact on the generations to come. She is now in the process of writing her first fantasy book, The Legends of Lemuria, so stay tuned for that when it's released. If you guys love the conversations that we're having, I invite you to drop a like on this video and don't forget to subscribe to this channel to keep getting the best ideas in human transformation. And without further ado, get ready to step into your true creative power with Ali Michelle. Ali Michelle, welcome to the podcast. How are you? I'm good. How are you doing? I'm doing good. Thank you so much for coming on. Uh, you know, I've been exposed <laughs> to your work uh, for a while now, and you've been a huge inspiration in my journey. And I, I know for a lot of people of our generation, and really, I wanted to start on some common ground, uh, something that we both share, which is I know our moms have been huge influences in both of our journeys. You know, when you were starting um, your own journey, I, I feel like your moms had a huge presence on your spiritual life and also your personal life as well. Same as me, you know, I had little, I call them like seeds of awakening from my mom since I was a very young kid. And she's, you know, this yoga teacher. I know your mom's like transformational coach into all these things, which is so cool. And I think a lot of people our age that are st starting a spiritual journey may not have that presence in their family um, j like we did. So I wanted to ask you just to start off, you know, talking a little bit about your mom's presence in your life and also speaking into the fact that not a lot of people may have that presence uh, especially like a spiritual presence in their family. So how can people navigate through that while they're, going through their own journey of awakening. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, first of all, that's incredible that you've had that relationship with your mom as well. Yeah. Um, it's really, it's something that we're missing in our modern day culture, like particularly Western culture is elders. Um, mm. You know, we kind of treat them like they're disposable, stuff them in retirement homes and call it a day, but it's yeah. like, yeah. there's so much wisdom you know it's very easy to read like an Eckhart Tolle book or the alchemist or whatever it may be and then like okay i have all this knowledge but it ha doesn't come and sink into your bones that really just comes from life experience and having people around you that are able to counsel you in that regard it's a huge gift um my mom like personally she's always been an artist so we grew up in this house and whenever I was angry or upset, she'd have me like splatter paint all over the walls and like really just taught me how to express my emotions through art. Um, but for us, it's like, I don't know if you've seen Gilmore Girls, but we kind of have that relationship where we're best friends and mm. we woke up, if you will, at the same time. Oh, really? Like we just started like laying on the floor and meditating together and I was like <laughs> 12 years old. So um, it was really fun to dive into this with her. Mm. 
that I didn't know that that you guys were waking up around the same time. I mean, my mom, we were living uh, for a while in Huntington Beach, California, and all I cared about at that point, I was, you know, around 14, 15. All I cared was playing basketball, girls, and going to the beach. Uh, and my mom was going through her own spiritual awakening, and I had no idea what she was going through at that point. And when I say like seeds of awakening, she's always like, like just whip out a Wayne Dyer quote on me, and I'm like, all right, power and intention, whatever. I always like put it right behind me, and it's really interesting in your story that you guys were waking up at the same age. How how did that go about? I'm really curious. Um, well, we both went through kind of a depression period. Um, you know, every everyone who survived to this point has some sort of like childhood trauma. Like if, if you've been on earth this long, you know, you've, you've made it through some things. Mm -hmm. um, and so both of us got to go through this like very healing experience together. And we both took our first yoga class together. And during it, we were looking at each other like, is she serious? Are we really like sitting in pigeon for this? This just hurts. Like, this is not fun. But afterwards we were on such a high and we're noticing the light peeking through the leaves. And we're, you know, I think that was like our first time kind of landing in our bodies. So it was just interesting to have my own mother be such a mirror for me. And to this day, I mean, my partner just met my mom for the first time and he was like, you guys are identical. Like our mannerisms, our jokes, everything. Like it's, it's very interesting. Hmm. What would you say has been the biggest lesson that you've learned from her in the past 12 months to make it easier? Hmm. I mean, I don't know about like 12 months specifically, but the one thing that hmm. stands out um, when I first started painting with her, she would have me paint upside down so that my mind couldn't control how I thought the result should look. Um, which I think I can apply to anything in my life. It's mm. like we have such a, a notion of how our lives should unfold or how things should look. Um, mm. But in reality, it's like you're kind of the paintbrush, not the painter, if, if you're really like surrendering to life coming through you in that way. And so mm. I think by teaching me to like constantly practice surrender, whether it's through art or my relationships or whatever it may be, that's like probably one of the greatest lessons she's given me. That's that's amazing. I wanted to get into that topic of surrender specifically with you. Um, just to share a little anecdote for me is I did a workshop. <laughs> I was living in Europe and I was in Italy and we did a workshop with a Tibetan calligrapher, you know, and he's so spiritual. Like he was a monk for I don't know how many years, like I think all of his 20s, he was a monk. And we did this exercise where we had to paint what they call an Enzo, which is basically just like a circle. And it was all like ritualistic. They, they made it so that, you know, you would go up, you would like say a prayer, get on your knees, and then they would hand you the paintbrush. You'd have to like bless it. And then you would do the Enzo, paint the circle. It's literally just a circle, but with like a fancy paintbrush. And then you weren't able to, you were not allowed to look at your circle afterwards. You're not, af you're not allowed to look at the result. And I think that really taught me a lot in that just metaphor of life. Like you should be creating, but never be so attached to the result that that's all you care about at the end. So I wanted to just explore that concept a little bit deeper with you and how that relates with your art in your life. Yeah, I mean, you know, what's a great example of that is cooking. Um, mm. I have this friend, Nadia. She's the number one chef in Switzerland, and she is an artist. She doesn't, like, she'll write recipes for other people, but she's never cooked by a recipe herself. Um, like, she'll never make the same meal twice in the same exact way. And I think mm. with a meal, you know, you're creating to destroy, essentially. Like, it's getting eaten. Maybe you take an Instagram photo of it. I don't know. But, like, mm. you'll never, it's not a painting you can hang in your house. And in my experience with poetry, you know, there's been like a very small amount of poems where I've been like, okay, that's not even me. That's just like, that's like the most honest work of art that has come yeah. through me. But even then when you're performing, there's like one performance where you're like, I fully surrendered to that. I broke, I gave all of myself away to that. And I, 
I can't do it again. Even if I made it with the same cadence and rhythm and sound, it's like, it will not have the same impact and frequency. I have to do it differently every single time. Um, I don't know if that makes sense, but I think that's true with anything. It's like art is so, so temporary. Hmm. In, in one interview you did with another poet in Q, uh, you guys talked about that people can feel the energy behind what you create with. And, you know, that's, I learned that, you know, just shortly ago, whenever, whenever I'm about to like, for example, reach out to a guest and if I'm in a stressed state, I just decide I'm not going to send the message. I'll send it another day. Cause I feel like that even words transmitted digitally can land people in a certain way. And that's actually how you built this huge Instagram presence on social media and, it was that energy in, for example, your captions that you were writing with. How do you, how do you see that now? Um, you know, and and how has that process been for you when you're creating? Just like getting into that state, and what state of energy do you get into when you want to create your best work? I just wanted to be honest. Like that's kind of my only rule mm. um, when it comes to writing. Is like, is this honest right now? And so, you know when I'm performing some of the older poems that have touched people, it's like, I really have to take a second and get back to the place I was when I wrote it. I think writing is the closest thing we have to time travel, writing and reading. Mm -hmm. Um, Because it's almost like, you know, a hand reaching out from that time. And, you know, whether it's a poem about grief or joy or heartbreak or just something that's no longer right now, um, it's a fingerprint that's left. And so when I write a poem, like it's a, it's a difficult balance because I don't want to, immediately expose it because once you expose something it's no longer sacred um i want it to like ferment but not to the point where it loses life if that makes sense so there's like a very small window after i write it when i'm like okay i'm gonna give this away now like it's ready um yeah i love that yeah there's something you know i wanted to to talk to you about um which is there's this huge space that, that you're getting into, the unknown. Uh, let's call it the crypto world. Um, and I haven't heard you talk about it too publicly. Um, and I wanted just to get into that. How did you get into this this space of the metaverse and NFTs, crypto? I feel like giving people a little intro of what I, that actually means um, from someone who's like really delved deep into it could be helpful. Yeah, I, I haven't spoken too much on it. I'm a I'm about to because we're launching our project. But um, so just just to kind of like break it down a little bit, um, Web two is like Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, you know, things that are on a third party platform. Whereas Web three is completely decentralized, which means like there's no one controlling it. Hmm. Um, and particularly NFTs is is different from crypto. Like it's run on Ethereum blockchain unless you're losing like a layer two solution, which is a different coin on top of it. Um, but I think it's really exciting and empowering for artists. I first got involved because my friend, Richard Wagner, he's an incredible violinist. Um, Mm -hmm. when I saw him, he was like, you know, doing Uber Eats and like working multiple jobs and, um, you know, a career as a Mm -hmm. violinist, I would imagine is probably not that lucrative, but then Mm -hmm. he bought a board ape like super early before it was, you know, the board ape yacht club, which if anyone's (laughs) listening, those apes are worth like, I believe half a mil per jpeg <laughs> um, at least give, give or take. at least <laughs> yeah, like that's yeah. that's probably like the lowest price mm-hmm. um and i saw him like become a part of this community you know and and every time i talked to him he's so excited and alive and inspired and so i went down this whole rabbit hole and i'm seeing like my painter friends no longer need art galleries my writer friends no longer need publishers musicians no longer you know need spotify and so mm-hmm or the record labels, like for artists who one were rarely compensated properly for their craft and also didn't necessarily have the freedom to make exactly what they wanted, how they wanted to and release it in the time they wanted. All of a sudden, like it's very empowering. That is to say like, it is the wild, wild west. Hmm. Um, and no one really knows what's going on fully because it's so new. So, you know, enter at your own risk, if you will, but it's definitely a very exciting time. It is. It is for sure. And, you know, I, I, I heard of it, you know, a while ago. There was a lot of resistance because it's a huge space. Um, 
And especially, you know, I wanted to just ask, like, as a poet, what do you, where do you think you can go in that direction of where you can take the use of this technology and really leverage it to your art in specific? You know, I think it's so exciting because, like, I know that there is a concern with the metaverse being desensitizing, but I would actually argue that it is far less desensitizing than Instagram because Hmm. there's not a constant requirement to be putting out art that's going to disappear in 24 hours. Like there's not really this creator burnout, if you will, you know, the NFT space, you put out a project when you're ready. And if you're entering the space, I think it's important to like understand it, support other projects that you really believe in before putting out your own. Um, but for example, I'm writing a fantasy book right now and it's exciting because like, imagine if there were 10,000 uniquely generated covers of Harry Potter and you owned one of those unique covers, you know, and within those books, there's like a special author note from JK Rowling that only Mm. you have for buying that, um, you know, or you own the rights to one page from Harry Potter, things like Mm. that. Um, you can also turn it into like a whole metaverse game. Um, like imagine having an avatar world, it's just kind of endless opportunity. So as an artist, I'm really excited because one, I don't feel the pressure of burnout and I can work on projects that are very meaningful and a lot more long-term versus instant gratification based. Hmm. I want to help people understand this creator burnout that you just mentioned. Um, you know, I've, I've heard of it recently described as like, you're, you're in this game and your content doesn't last more than a couple hours in in terms of like relevancy and how much the algorithm shows it to other people have you ever gone through this specific creator burnout how did you get through that and how how has that experience been for you yeah i mean i got into instagram eight years ago um so it's become very difficult to upkeep like i think at first i was playing the game and doing the whole like travel around the world like take a photo with the follow me anywhere (laughs) hand and a girl's butt with a sun emoji like (laughs) but um you quickly realize like bali out here (laughs) yeah we're in bali and tahiti there's some blue ass water um Um, but it's a very, it's like fast food, you know, it's just Mm. at first you're like, oh, this is, this is going to be great. And then you're like, I feel sick. Like I feel empty and sick now. Um, and so it kind of dawned on me, I had to make a switch of like, I'm not an influencer. I'm a writer, you know, Mm. I I would like to be an artist. I want to make things that I will be proud of long-term. Like look at Rumi and Hafiz, like those poems have lasted since 1250, Hmm. creating something that is that honest where it lasts through so many generations you know i'm not saying i'll do that but i'm just saying like that is something that i would far rather aspire to versus like having 15 million on tiktok yeah yeah that's so key that you said that i want to highlight that because we become so focused on the numbers and you know oh i'm about to reach 10k and let's go like going to do a massive celebration at my crib, invite all my friends when I get there. But it's like, where are you headed? You know, where where are you going? What do you want to leave behind? Um, I don't remember the exact quote, but I heard Gary Vee once say, like, you know, it's not about, you know, the numbers or the followers. It's about the legacy that you leave behind. And I like to ask, you know, at such a young age, you're building a legacy already. I want to know what you feel is that legacy that you're that you're leaving for the next generations. You know, I just I feel like it's a very apathetic world. It is. And I personally have to fight to stay connected to myself and my emotions. And so my like subconscious prayer if you will behind every caption and everything I put out is like it almost be this safe haven when you're scrolling um you know where you can just take a moment and feel something like i just want to make people feel something and breathe that's like breathe and the inundation of all the meaningless content that surrounds it yeah and like you know i think some people are meant to have um a crazy legacy like gary v but for me i'm just like i just want to make things i think it's so achievement based right now and i'm not saying that's a bad thing at all but for me personally like i got very sick last year and i couldn't really do much like 
I finally got to the point where I could walk. Um, so I'd take like one rock wow. walk around the block every day. And I'd like, so appreciate the flowers and the sunset and all these simple things. And, um, it just transitioned me from like, how much can I do to how much can I notice? And it was a really big shift in my life because now I'm just like, I really appreciate the tiny perfect moments. And I think that that's something really important to note is like talking about legacy. It's like, how are you actually spending your time? You know? Hmm. Hmm. I didn't know that, that, that you were sick last year. How was that experience getting through all of that? It felt like an initiation because I've never really had major health problems. And I moved from Hawaii and first one of the first days I got here, I got COVID and it just like took me out for two months. And it was such a, I don't know, I guess in my head, I was like, no, I won't get it. Like, and if I did, I wouldn't get hit that hard. And you just yeah. don't think about it. Um, but then I felt like it was a very deep initiation and I had to kind of reflect on my entire life so far. And I just didn't touch Instagram. I didn't really care for the first time. And I was so caught up in work before that, you know, just like working myself to the bone. And then all of a sudden I'm like, look at this flower. This is a perfect flower, you know? Smell it's that just, shit. She smell that shit. <laughs> just smell it. And it sounds like so silly mm. and simple, but it's just like, when, like, I'm asking you this, like, when have you felt the best? What are those moments that mean the most to you? Hmm. I feel that when you're connected, to something, you know, higher and you're in the present moment, you know, just being in the present moment, I feel is what helps you become a clear channel to all this higher emotions that you can feel because that's closer to source. Like when we're, when we're away from source is when we're in these like lower vibration and lower vibrational emotions and we're stuck in this loop of negativity. When we just open up to that, we realize like we're on this spectrum and it's fine to feel those negative emotions it's fine to feel everything i've heard you say like my job as a poet is to feel everything deeply and i resonate a lot with that and i feel that when you're feeling everything deeply then the universe opens up to you wide open yeah i mean i think there's kind of a misconception in the spiritual community too of like mm. low vibration high vibration mm. positive negative but it's just like I don't want my song or my life song to just be a high note. Yeah, you know, it's not yeah. a very good song. Your favorite songs have depth and layers to them. And it's like, I wouldn't want to remove, you know, the colors and the palette that I would paint with. And so like joy, sorrow, pain, pleasure, all of it, it's just part of it. I'm not mm. trying to like transcend my humanity, if you will. Um, and I think it's just like, when we feel disconnected, it's okay. Like, I think I have a tendency to make myself feel wrong where I'm just like, why do I feel this way? Everything's so good. I have so much to be grateful for, but I don't want to bypass the pain either because it's like, okay, what are you here to teach me? There's a natural intelligence to my body. Mm. Yeah. 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 I'd love to talk about that process of alchemy that I've heard you speak a lot about. Like if, cause I understand and I feel that completely that we have to feel every spectrum but at some point, I feel like if there are these painful emotions or maybe feelings that are coming from a fearful aspect of our personality, how do you transmute that and, you know, turn it into something that has more light or allows the light to crack in? I would say, like, that comes from my childhood like I was saying with my mom of, of how she'd have me paint when I was angry and like splatter it at the walls or things like that it's like you know I'll feel it but I think all the honest art I've made that has touched people has come out of necessity you know where it's like this is the only thing I feel like I can do in this moment is put pen to paper right now like I I think that is something I'd really like to say is important is I've never written something for the world like, I don't sit there and think like, ah, oh, I bet, I bet this will like mean this to these people. It's like, yeah. ironically with poetry, if it's so personal, it'll relate to everyone because we're human, you know, we're going through similar experiences, even though they're different stories. Hmm. Yeah. And then we're, we're reflections for other people as well. And I feel like the power in poetry and writing is that, you know, words are universal in the way that, you know, 
it can even tra- transpass language and just the specific word because put together, it creates meaning. It creates emotion in people. Um, and I've heard you say also about your second poetry book, The Rose That Blooms in the Night. That, that, was, that was written from the heart and the first book was written from the head. And I was really curious about that. And I, I read, you know, some aspects of both. And I definitely resonate with that. You know, I felt that that second poetry book was, you know, it hit deep on some levels um, for me as well. Like, I'll read you maybe some quotes that I that I resonated with. Um, but walk me through your process with going from writing from the head and then writing from the center of our chest, writing from that, from that energetic center, the heart. You know, I think it's just, it's knowing you're safe to come from your head to your heart. Like we're a very heady culture. I think that's why embodiment practices like dance and yoga are so good because it's like, it's very easy to just be like a brain and then you're using your body as the sticks that hold up your brain. Um, Mm -hmm. But circling back to the very beginning of this podcast, it's what I was saying of like, you can have knowledge, but it's not wisdom until it's lived in your bones. And I think that, you know, I wrote that first book when I was 18. So I was super young. I hadn't quite lived the things that I was talking about yet. I was just like, well, this sounds right. Um, Mm -hmm. And that was kind of my Mm -hmm. first experience with poetry. And then the rose, you know, it's like, okay, like I, I moved across the ocean, like had my first heartbreak, you know, some, I experienced some grief. Like I got a little seasoning on my soul. Um, but even now looking back at the rose, I'm just like, okay, that was a different person. Um, cause I have my third collection coming out next year. So it's just like, I think as an artist and I know like in Q, a lot of other people I know feel this way. It's hard to read some of your past stuff. Cause you're just like, I've already grown so much from this. And so I think it, not getting frustrated with like where you were and just appreciating the entire thing. Cause it's all just sculpting your soul. It's all making you a better artist. And the best thing you can do as a writer is just not deny any experience, like welcome all of it. Hmm. Yeah. And also letting it, letting it marinate. I've I've heard you use that word as well. Like marinating that knowledge that, that you just learned, for example. And I feel like sometimes I hesitate a lot too. Um, You know, if I want to put out, you know, a video talking about x thing and i don't feel like i've lived it it's like there's this huge resistance because it's coming from from the head it's coming from the head and it doesn't feel authentic it doesn't feel real in a way yeah and i will say this like especially in the new age community it it takes a lot to actually like speak from your soul like speak from your own experience instead of paraphrasing and I'll say this, like yoga is a good example, right? Like if you go to a yoga class and, you know, a teacher is quoting the Buddha, it's like, okay, that sounds nice. But if they're sharing a life experience that they just went to that you can relate to, it just hits differently, Um, you know, because it's not, it's not some like far away monk from thousands of years ago, not to like disrespect the Buddha, obviously the Buddha is great. Um, But if someone can like somehow apply those yoga principles to sitting in traffic, to losing your job, like to these normal everyday human experiences it's a lot more relatable and I think like as an artist your job is to relate to everyone else without trying but just by being honest with your own experiences Hmm. what is something that you feel that you can talk about with so much I would say authority because you've lived it so deeply that's a good question I mean I look at it like a spiral, right? So love, relationship, grief, loss, um, you know, consciousness, all these practices, poetry. Mm. I could have talked about all this years ago, but it was like the outer ring of a spiral. And every, every day I'm going through these things that allow it to go deeper and deeper and closer to the center. So I can't really be like, oh, I've mastered this one subject, but I can say like, as the years go by, if I'm consciously moving through my breakdowns, like completely aware and like, okay, this is my classroom. This moment is my curriculum. Like I'm, I'm going to leverage this and learn from it somehow. You know, I think paying very close attention 
to what life is revealing to you in that moment is really important. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. For me, I would say, you know, I've been, you know, living through this period of just opening my heart and, you know, I had also this tough breakup, um, about a year ago. And, you know, it's something that you always keep to yourself and you don't, and you don't want anyone to really look at that, that pain that you're going through. So you just put on a mask and, I read one of the quotes in, in The Rose That Blooms the Night that actually, you know, I wrote it down here. It says, for those with an open heart can never be broken. So that's so powerful, you know, just living life with a closed heart, I think, or I feel that it just closes you off from so many opportunities, so many people that you can meet, so many aspects about yourself you know, I think an open heart just allows you to go within. That's the main concept uh, of this podcast, Just Tap In, is really, really internalizing everything. You know, learning to see everything in the outside, these painful experiences, and then go within and be like, all right, what is that? What is that a reflection of within me? Everything outside is reflecting back to me who I am. And when I had that paradigm shift, I was like, okay, now I don't see these situations as, you know, oh, this just happened to me or whatever. It's like, oh, let me just tap in <laughs> and see what what inside there caused that or reflected or projected that to come into my reality. Yeah, and... Sometimes you don't know why. Like, I think it's mm. also important that it's okay not to know why. Um, and really it's like, this is why I love breath work because the experiences you're talking about with heartbreak, it's like, yeah, just keep your heart open. It's, it's a very <laughs> difficult thing to do actually after you've yeah. gotten drop kicked like that. Um, so I think it's like consciously not bracing for impact in those moments. Like when you want to contract, when you want to tense, it's like, how can I... How can I soften? How can I let go? You know, like mm. if a drunk driver gets in an accident, the drunk person is the least injured one because their muscles are relaxed. Whereas when they're tense and tough, the bones break far easier and there's a lot more damage. So if it's possible to soften and remain calm and use your breath as a tool in those moments, like my breath is my greatest tool. It's the one thing that I always have on me and there's nothing in life you can't breathe through. Right. So I think like having these tools in your back pocket are very important, whether that's art, whether that's breath work or yoga, or whatever it may be. Like there's not really one specific way, but it's like we all kind of need ways to move through this experience because life is immeasurably hard and beautiful. It's all of it, right? Yeah, breath work. I love that you said that. That's been a huge tool that, you know, I, I recommend people to explore deeper. It's like, but you're just breathing. What do you, what do you mean? Like, I feel like we don't, we never get taught how to breathe, which sounds weird just saying that out loud, but it's like, we don't, we don't get taught to, to breathe. Um, and also with the breath is this huge metaphor for life as well. And one teacher of mine, he explained it as like this three-step process. Like you're, you have the inhale. People think, all right, yeah, inhale, exhale, inhale, exhale, but there's this hold that kind of bridges those two you know when you're inhaling it's like that feminine you're you're receiving and if you're receiving way too much there's disharmony within you you're, you're gonna explode like if you just keep breathing in oxygen you're gonna die um the same as if you're just exhaling 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 and that hold i think is really metaphorical of that space of transition too you know we've been talking a lot about transitioning moments and from what I perceive I feel like you're going through a transition I'm going through a transition um, what can you speak into these transitory states when we're not in the known world but we're kind of headed into the new world which is also where humanity is right now so how has that transitioning been for you I mean life is an in-between and the in-between is like a very a sacred place to be but it's like I don't know I think 
there, there's those two opposing very deep human desires of freedom and security. Mm. And it's why people like want a nine to five. So they have financial security, but then like a part of them feels like they're dying because they want freedom. Mm. And so it's like very easy when you're in an in-between to just like run and leap and try and find the next chapter of like, Oh, this is my new partner. This is my new job. This is what I'm doing now. Like, you know, you want to have a sure answer when someone says, Oh, who are you? What do you do? And I don't know has become kind of an inexcusable answer, but it's like, no one really knows. Like we're all kind of uncertain and a little lost inside because things are changing moment to moment. But I think like longing and loneliness are two very essential ingredients to our humanity. It's very humbling. And to be humble isn't like, oh, I'm nothing. It's like, no, I have the confidence to be nothing in a world that is constantly trying to tell me I have to be something. Hmm. In in the end, we just we just are. And we've had a lot of guests on the podcast. They talk about just being enough, knowing that you're enough. And it was funny that you said that, like when someone asks you like, oh, who are you? You immediately just want to ramble out and throw out labels out there like, oh, I'm a student. Or I'm doing this. I'm doing that. Um, and it's it can get so easy to get caught up and obsess about our label, our identity. And I feel like that freedom that you're speaking into is kind of like, um, you know, a gateway to that freedom is letting go of these certain labels that tie us to certain things. Um, like for example, if I were to ask you, like, who are you? What would you, what would you respond now? (laughs) i wouldn't really have an answer i'd just say yeah i'll let you know (laughs) i'll let you know (laughs) like a spiritual double talk way of like oh i'm consciousness having a human experience like like i have the right answer i am like yeah i I I am bro (laughs) realistically i'm i'm not a monk and so Uh that that doesn't feel authentic it's like I, i like that yeah it's just always evolving i I feel it when I'm meditating. I feel it when I do breath work. I feel it when I'm creating. It's like there is a part of me that feels eternal. There's a part of me that feels like it's hasn't been born and can never die. But that part is like I have to consciously work to access that. And I know that that's, you know, a place that resides in all of us. But talk about heaven and hell. It's like that's in your body. You know, like we slip into those experiences moment to moment, depending on like where our mind is at it could be a palace or a prison and so i think that's something that's like not often talked about hmm. Hmm. a recurring line that i've heard you speak into from your po- poetry is this this line of when we avoid death we avoid life is there is there a story behind that and how that came to be yeah i am um... I lived on Kauai for five years, which is like a a very teeny tiny island in Hawaii. So small, it doesn't show up on a map. Um, Mm. It's a fascinating place. It's very mystical, very different than LA where I grew up. And this last time around, it was about a year ago, um, I met a woman named Kelly and she got funding to start a end of life care center and a birth care center. So there were these natural spring pools that women could come and give birth in. And there were like Hawaiian elders there that would kind of assist and walk you through it. And then up the road, there was this end of life care center where people people could come and transition and leave in a way. Like there was this elder named Renee and she would play the harp for people in their final moments. Like a different one would sing. Like there were men on the property just like carrying things and bringing water. Like it was just very beautifully done because their whole thing was like, why is this such a scary thing? Like when you come home at the end of the day, you come home, you slip off your clothes, you get into bed. It's the same thing. Like you're slipping off your human suit. Um, Mm -hmm. And so I spent some time with them for a couple of weeks. And that was like one thing that I asked the elder that was playing the harp. I was like, you know, doesn't it scare you to be around death every day to like watch people transition so often? And she's like, no, baby, death is just a graduation. And so I really had this theme of death because right after that was when I got sick and I felt like my whole life paused, like it was a massive ego death. Um, Like I lost my business, my relationship, like pretty much everything at once, moved home. Um, And so I would say my theme last year was kind of learning to understand and have a deep reverence and respect for death 
because I think we do everything we can to distract ourselves from the fact that life is fragile and it's not guaranteed. And like, we will transition someday and exchange worlds. Um, but I think that that's kind of what keeps us numb. So that's kind of where that line came from of like, we avoid death, we avoid life. Like if you're actually aware that you're going to die, you're not caring what people think. You're not checking your hair six times in the mirror. You're just going out and you're experiencing life. And I also think that a lot of our beliefs around death dictate that feeling, dictate, you know, if if we feel like that this is all there is um, and, you know, it's this human suit and you were given one chance, um, it might dictate your life differently. Uh, I'd like to know kind of your spiritual metaphysical beliefs around death. Um, just to keep things light. I know the conversation has been deep. Just to keep things... Uh, <laughs> just kidding <laughs> <laughs> it, it's the both and right you have to have a sense of humor about <laughs> things. i think that's like um uh, my friend dakota is always like the mark of someone who's taken their spirituality too far is they've lost their sense of humor about yeah. themselves <laughs> yeah it's like don't forget to laugh right <laughs> yeah mm. um i mean honestly i think death is peaceful like for my personal beliefs i think it's just kind of like an exhale it's, it's almost like a, a weightlessness. Like, I think life is the thing that's, you know, it's hard. It's challenging. It's so intense the way we feel and experience so much all at once. But real talk to be human is like the envy of the gods. You know, can you imagine looking down at us and being like, man, I wish I could taste pizza. I wish I could swim in the ocean and feel the salt water on my skin. I wish I could like fall in love just one more time, you know, or experience like, what it's like to watch my kid be born. Like there's so mm. many things and it's not just the good stuff. It's all of it. Like I said, that makes the whole symphony. Hmm. And we forget to feel or welcome pleasure in our lives as well. I feel like in this, in this rat race of like, all right, you have to go out, study this, get a job in that. I think we lose a lot of pleasure that we get to feel, that we're gifted this ability to feel pleasure and also feel pain. And we just like keep ourselves in this spectrum of the emotional, you know, huge spectrum that we can access. And yeah, like you said, the gods must be very envious of like, like what is, what is an orgasm to them? You know, like what is that? I think that's something that's so human, so powerful um, and a lot of the, the social structures around us kind of suppress that, that pleasure that we get to feel. Absolutely. And it's also like, fear is not the best way to control people. It's distraction. Like if you're so busy, like giving your time to TikTok and like watching the rabbits being pulled out of a hat, like you're not actually paying attention to what's going on. You're not actually seeing the truth. Like you are so entertained and having so much stuff down your throat that you forget what your own voice sounds like. You forget what you actually want to do. It's very difficult to even hear from yourself nowadays. So I think that's kind of a, a hard thing about our culture is like you go to school, you go right from high school to college, you go right from college to a job. And it's like, that's why the in-between is so important and so special. It's like, you have to take time to get to know yourself. And that's a constant process. <laughs> yeah, completely agree. And I think that's powerful coming from, you know, we're in our 20s and self-awareness is not, I think it's the biggest, it, it's probably the biggest theme of this decade, you know, of this, of these, you know, 20s, the second floor is like, get to know yourself, get to know yourself. Because if you don't, if you don't make that, that consistent effort of like, what do I like to do? What moves this, you know, center? What moves this heart? We, we may, you know, fall into that same trap that you're talking about, like this, this matrix of, <laughs> I liked how you use the, the rabbits getting pulled out of the of the of the hat it's a distraction too distraction from your true power from who you really are it's also like okay going back to the surrender thing like it's not necessarily mm. your job to figure it out especially in your 20s like if you had told me that you know at 25 i would be 
doing a drop of 10,000 JPEGs that was going to buy a sustainable village and retreat center, I would think you're insane. If you would tell me any of the things I've done, you know, in high school, like I was going to be an acupuncturist. I was going to go to school and like study holistic medicine. And so it's just like, trust the randomness and the plot twists and the turns. It's what makes your story interesting. Hmm. hundred percent. What, what can you tell us about your village and your um, JPEGs? Yeah. So my sister Alexis and I, we co-founded a community called Warriors and that's like a mental health and wellness community. We transitioned that to be NFTs, but then we wanted to create something in the metaverse that would kind of counteract how numbing and desensitizing it is. So we're doing a drop of 10,000 uniquely generated 3D mermaids. Um, and there are a few intentions with that. One is to onboard more women into the NFT space because only 5% of sales are women right now, which is like wow. nuts. Um, it's incredibly low. And mm. so we're just trying to like educate. So there'll be an educational aspect to it, like breaking down, okay, how do I set up my MetaMask? What even is a MetaMask? Um, but then the profits from the the drop will go towards purchasing a bunch of acres outside of Texas, like in a very nature part. And we have an architect who can make a completely sustainable village. Like the water from the houses are going to flow into the garden. Um, and that way we can have like a holistic health mental health and wellness retreat center so that as you feel numb and you need to come home to yourself, it's like, Hey, just go there for a week. Like you got the JPEG, you have access, have fun. That's fucking dope. I just needed to say that. Thank you. <laughs> That's amazing. That's amazing. And just to go off that. Yeah. What is, what does being a warrior mean to you? You know, I think, for me, what I'm noticing within myself, at least, is this mental wobbling that's happening nowadays where it's like, you know, should I do this? Should I do that? Like vaccinated, not vaccinated? Should I like do this job or that? It's just like there's so much counteractive information. I could Google anything and find like evidence to support my argument on both sides. And so it's very <laughs> difficult to actually know the way. And I think what we're attracted to most in people now is someone who's sure, like for better or for worse, you know. Um, when someone's like sure and confident within themselves, it's like you trust them, you feel safe around them. And so I think like right now I'm like, no, I need to have my instincts be rock solid if I'm going to remain soft in this world. Because if you're soft inside and outside, it's like you can be tipped any which way. You can be convinced of anything. You can be gaslit to believe anything. And that is kind of a dangerous thing in the spiritual community. It's like you can double talk yourself into anything and say like, oh, my abusive relationship was fine. Cause like I learned from it, but it's like, you still went through that. Um, mm. So I think having like a really healthy sense of discernment is essential. Mm. Yeah. We've talked about discernment in other, in the, in other episodes. And it's also, I heard you, cause we think of a warrior and we think of this, you know, muscular man with, you know, kilos of, pounds of uh armor on him and i've heard you speak into that armor and what what does that what does that do for us this armor you know i think our task is not to suit up for battle it's to strip down um but in order to do that like i said you have to have rock solid instincts you know you can't be watching the rabbits be pulled out of a hat and so that's really what our we're training our warriors to do is like okay, let's, let's like not only just educate you and shove information, but like, how are you going to process that information? Like, you know, how are you going to learn how to learn if that makes sense and move about the world? And I think that like, what if when you first got to school, they taught you how to self-regulate your nervous system or they taught you how to breathe? You know, um, Jim Quick's a good example where he's like, there's so many people that tell you like, oh, I just have a shit memory. And he's like, well, you can train that. You know, there's so many things that we were taught are just the way they are, but that's just not true. Mm. Yeah. And and that's also another another teacher, uh, Dr. Joe Dispenza. He talks about like you can access your genius because there's a gene inside of you that if you activate it and that's the genius gene, you can become that, you know, there's a gene for health. There's a gene for illness. There is, you know, whatever you want to upregulate is what you create within this human vessel. Like we can access and tap into all of that infinite amounts of creativity, 
infinite amounts of intuition and that's really this new human that's emerging uh in the world right now i feel that a lot of us you know younger generations are waking up to these capabilities and we think there's something wrong with us i know in your story you you were labeled as you had add and you were you know had to shut all that creativity down and take adderall ritalin and all these medications to suppress that but i think we sometimes have to embrace that you know we're not going to be just like the older generations or like our parents like we're tapping into so many new capabilities uh as human beings that we're going to create we're literally essentially creating a, a new species as well yeah and like joe dispenza's work is a fantastic example i mean some of the most incredible experiences i've had have been in his meditations um, yeah. especially like being sick i was like okay i have to be my own doctor because i had a friend who had a same time as me went to the hospital they gave him tylenol and sent him home and charged him like you know a lot so it's important that like no one is going to tell you the way no one's going to come and save you like you're it you you can have helping hands along the way but it's like only you can really direct your course hmm. Hmm. Ali, i wanted to open a space to share some poetry uh for people um i don't consider myself a poet but when I was preparing for this episode, as I told you before rec recording, I just had, you know, this this necessity to write something. Um, and I don't know where that came from. I think it's just one of those like, you know, you feel like something that creative force within you is like just shaking and you're like, all right, let's let's go. And I feel like I perceive that from your poems that they come out of this necessity from your your creative force. So I just wanted to see if we can open a space to share that with people. Um, if you would want to share any of, of your own poems that you feel would resonate with what we've talked about in this conversation. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm excited to hear yours. I'm glad you got that experience because it's so yeah. incredible. I don't have you seen the movie Soul? Of course. I love Soul. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, when they are like in the zone, if you will, and they're going into another world almost like that, mm -hmm. that's how it feels. So that's like my wish for everyone. I'm like, yeah. whatever your art is, I hope you get to experience that. That flow state. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. There you go. Um, would you like to go first? What would mm -hmm. you prefer? I would, I would say that would be better. <laughs> cool. All right. It has to do. All right. Well, you'll see. You'll see. I love that we got into the warrior because that's something that inspired this, this piece. All right. All right, here we go. My voice is going to shake, just so you know. That's good. That means it's important <laughs> to you. All right, let's do it. <clears throat> A pure heart ripples to a billion other hearts. But the overemphasis on the intellect led our species to a catastrophic restart. Within us all lies a warrior that still hears a silent yet potent beat in the center of their chest. A warrior that adapts to a culture that lives in their mind. The rest of society assures to themselves that this type of love is hard to find. Connecting in this center exalts the divinity that runs through our veins and embraces the mortality that remains. Let's awaken the slumbering giant that has the power to alchemize the darkness that the collective can no longer metabolize. Pulling back the curtains and pulling out sunglasses as their eyes begin to harmonize with the incoming waves of light. Humanity is ready for the birth of an army of conscious leaders to take flight. The power to transform reality lies in the cleverness in our head, which holds the map with the directions of the road ahead. But ultimately, the chauffeur is the force in our core, holding the benevolence and compassion that opens the door to a new earth. 
a golden era of harmony that the mystics have revealed in their visions and what has even forced the scientifics to bat their eye. The funny thing is, you'll never find it out there. But if you dare to look behind all the illusions of fear created to separate this power from us, you'll reach the long-awaited epiphany that that reality is already embedded in the symphony of your interior. Go within and find it. What are you waiting for? You are a warrior if you just tap in. <laughs> Damn. I felt oh my that. God, deep breath. Is your heart racing? <laughs> yeah. Damn, that heart is on fire right now. How'd that feel? felt amazing it felt amazing to express it yeah mm. yeah i mean speaking on inky like he always says a poem isn't complete until it's shared like till yeah. you give it away to someone so i love there that you go. yeah thank you for holding the space for me to share it and whoever's yeah, listening whoever's listening right now uh also thank you there's so many good lines in there that was awesome that was your first poem i wouldn't call it the first but probably one of the first that i would consider to put out there or share in a way well mm. congratulations i also like that you like slipped the podcast name there at the end that was great. <laughs> shameless plug <laughs> shameless plug in your palm it's hard to do <laughs> uh thank you all right i want to hear yours okay so i feel like this one goes with what we've been talking about um so last year I was in LA and it was my friend Christine's birthday and I was there and this woman, her name's Mia Magic and she yeah, like I shows up everywhere in a witch's hat <laughs> and she's like drinking juice that she made in her garden, you know, like one of those, one of those witchy people. Yeah. And she sits down across from me and, you know, she tells me talking about what do you do? She's an etymologist, um, which is like the study of language and words. And I made a joke and I was like, yeah, I'm super weird um, because like I, I'm kind of awkward when you first meet me and talk to me, but I just have learned to embrace that in conversations. And she's like, <laughs> well, you know, the original meaning of the word weird meant destiny, like a person on the path of their destiny. Mm. And it was spelled Y-R-D or W-Y-R-D. Um, and mafia meant a coven of women, like wise mother. So yeah. there's just like, we sat there and I learned all these meanings wow. of different words. Like, isn't that fascinating? And words are spells. So I can see why she's practicing magic too. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and when you meet a woman named Mia Magic in a witch's hat that tells you that weird is a good thing, you know, you, you feel pretty good about yourself. You're like, yeah. okay, I'm inspired now. Um, <laughs> so that's where this poem came from. And awesome. by the way, like if you're if you're writing a poem, I think it's important to just get one true line, like one honest piece, and it's like a diving board. The rest of the poem will kind of write itself. Okay. The original meaning of the word weird, W-Y-R-D, was destiny, meaning to be weird is to be one who follows the path of their destiny meaning that normal is a clear road that has already been paved. And when you're weird, no one else will show you the way. What is my destiny? I can't help but wonder what I'm even doing here sometimes. I go about my life on autopilot and forget that I'm alive. Is the point to work? To hustle for my purpose, check off that list of to-dos so I don't feel worthless? Or is it to find the one? Fall in love, create a family until death decides to come? Or maybe it's to fight in the battleground of my mind at the past that tries to take hold of me and I ignore the way my heart stops when I trip over my own thoughts at the sight of your name. I'll smile when I tell the story of how I transcended it all, how much it taught me, how I did enough ceremonies and wrote enough poems to walk on water wearing Christine robes. But nowadays, I think I'd rather wear a black cloak so my shadow becomes my cape and everyone around me can embrace being gloriously human. That's right, gloriously human. They can love and dance and fuck and fight and smoke and eat and fall to their knees because my lungs were the very first thing that God kissed when I came into this world. So every inhale 
and exhale is a love story of purpose. So I hope you're weird like me, one who's on the path of their destiny. Okay, that's all. <laughs> um, wow. I felt that. <laughs> destiny destiny is a topic, wow, that I've I really struggled with. Um, not in a bad way, just like the destiny, like what, what even, what even is that? And I felt like there's certain things in, in my path that are like breadcrumbs that I would call them maybe synchronicities that you just say like, Hmm, like that was, that was already written or that was supposed to happen. So thank you for sharing that. I really loved that you tied in all these aspects that are so hard for us sometimes to understand, you know, and that being weird, being different can lead you to your destiny. When we try to be the same, I think we block out our individual path that we're meant to be on. Yeah, I think like understanding your own unique language and spark. I had this conversation with my friend um, I went to dinner with Nadia, the chef, and my friend Dakota, who's an incredible dancer. And we were all talking about like, we each have a silent language, right? For Nadia, like she stops thinking when she's cooking. You know, that's that's her telephone to spirit, if you will. For Dakota, it's when he's dancing. Like they're accessing the same place doing very different things. For me, ironically, when I'm thinking the least is actually when I'm writing. You know, I'm seeing it in images. It's coming through me as its own force. I'm not like, okay, I'm gonna write this sentence now. It's like, no, I'm in a different place. And it's coming from such a sure known, like that warrior place inside of me. So I think like being brave enough to try things and explore your language and also like being willing to be bad at it too. Like write some shitty poems, you know, look like an idiot when you dance, like just constantly practice going up against that judge and perfectionist in your mind so that your art finally has room to breathe. I agree with that and Ali I wanted to start uh, wrapping all this beautiful beautiful conversation up um, firstly asking you you know we have a final what we call the final trio which are really short rapid fire questions that you can answer in any way that you want it could be even up to one word and First, I want to just ask, where can people find you? Where would you direct people that want to connect with you further and any upcoming projects that you'd like people to get ready for? Yeah, um, I mean, you can find me for my poetry on Instagram. I have a couple books out. And then if you're interested in Sirens and, and being part of the Eco Village, um, we're dropping that like the first week of May. And you can find that out on Twitter. It's just Ali Michelle and it'll come up as like Metascribe. Um, and then, yeah, We Are Warriors is like the community that I teach weekly classes at as well. Hmm. Awesome. And for the final trio, uh, Ali, one of the first one is, is some, some question that, that you asked in a previous podcast with Blue, um, a poem by James Herbert, I believe. And it's, what are you running from? What are you running towards? and why oh, that's rapid fire oh man <laughs> um i'm running both from my fear and towards my fear you know because i know that my freedom is on the other side of that that would be like the abridged version hmm. Hmm. The second question is the next two are intuitive. Uh, I prepared the first one. The next two are are really intuitive. But what is one characteristic of a warrior that you would encourage the next generations of leaders to embody and practice? I would say two things. One, brutal honesty, even when it's hard. Just don't water yourself down. And two, like having a fierce sense of compassion. And I don't mean like enabling people's behavior, but I mean like deep compassion. Um, 
understanding like everything it took for one a person to even get here in the first place and two everything that they've been through to arrive in this moment hmm. the final final question is what final nugget of wisdom would you leave anyone that's on a path of self-exploration and awakening I would look at life as your guru. You know, my greatest thing would be, it's okay to look at teachers and read books and listen to podcasts and take in this information. But again, if you really want that wisdom, like just pay as close attention as you possibly can to your own life and what it's presenting to you. Mm, I love that. Great way to finish. Ali, thank you so much. I just first wanted to acknowledge you for your work and all of the things that you've created in this world from your heart you know from this space of freedom and from this space of flow you've really inspired me and i know you'll inspire many 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 more people to come so thank you for making the time for our audience and this conversation um i wish you the best in you know all your future endeavors i'll be supporting all the way and I know our audience will be very eager to learn what you're going to be up to because uh, you're you're headed into the future with all these new technologies and spaces. So um, I just wanted to commend you for, you know, your wisdom, your intelligence, um, the way that you speak into things through your words. Um, and, and yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for, for all of this. Thank you. Thank you for creating a platform for the people to, to use their voices and also for really honing in on your own. It's, it's a gift. So mm -hmm. thank you so much for having me. Of course.